And now we're going <coughs> to give the microphone to uh, Professor John Prohl, who is also coming from uh, London. He will play the role of the, our financial advisor because he's going to talk about the cost of uh, a perioperative AKI. Uh, John? Thank you very much, Tom. Let me just um, uh, share the appropriate talk. Very good. I hope you can see my uh, title slide there. Uh, so, uh, my name is John Prowl. I'm a, a physician intensivist and nephrologist uh, from the Royal London Hospital in the UK. That's the building that you can see uh, there in the background of this title side. It's one of the uh, London's major trauma centres. We do an awful lot of major abdominal surgery. We have a sister's hospital up the road that does most of the cardiac surgery. And myself and, and our wide research group have a deep interest in perioperative medicine and improving its outcomes. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today is a little bit about uh, the cost uh, uh, by that, I mean, the financial and other related costs of acute kidney injury. And this may help you uh, convince uh, people within your wider team, uh, surgeons and indeed hospital administrators, that perhaps that your quality improvement or other exercises to improve AKI outcomes or reduce AKI in instance are beneficial to their overall program and you should pursue them. Because really there are several misnomers about perioperative AKI that we have to challenge and, and that has already been challenged in the previous talks. I'm not going to recapitulate all of that excellent exposition that you've had, but just to make the point that people come along and say, is AKI complicating surgery really important? They'll say things like mild AKI is just an indicator of short-term physiological instability. It's an epiphenomenon. It's associated with worse outcomes because other they're, they're it's a um, uh, hypotension and other um, uh, intraoperative events are also associated with adverse outcomes. And I think we've seen strong evidence that that's not true, um, <clears throat> but it's still a, 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 um, a, a, th a supposition we need to challenge. There's also the idea that if you do get severe AKI, once you've recovered, uh, you don't need to worry about the patient anymore. Uh, if you die or develop end-stage renal failure, well, you're clearly in a box there, but the majority of patients, uh, we treat them and they disappear off, and therefore they will only have the initial costs associated with their episode. They won't have um, uh, ongoing costs <clears throat> associated with the acquisition of chronic disease and ongoing risk, and again, that is uh, far from true and uh, a presumption that was often made in the past, but one that we should challenge. Uh, so why... Are we really interested in perioperative AKI? Uh, well, surgery has a low short-term mortality, at least from the point of view of outcomes assessment overall. You know, I'd hope that relatively few of your elective surgical patients die, but many of them are harmed short of passing over the threshold to die during the acute episode. And we need to be able to detect that. And perioperative complications are the way in which we often detect that. And in, but most importantly, they're associated with adverse long-term outcomes as well as adverse short-term outcomes, uh, because the burden of surgery it persists beyond the perioperative period. And therefore, if we are perioperative physicians of various backgrounds, anaesthetic, uh, medical or surgical, we need to be interested in the long-term consequences of the short-term harm and uh, its burden on the healthcare system that we operate in. Okay, and this includes its cost. And I will um, uh, put it to you that perioperative acute kidney injury um, is a uniquely impactful perioperative complication uh, because of its ability to impact on other organ systems, uh, because it's one that we can relatively easily monitor for and detect, and <clears throat> it's one where we've got a lot of data to demonstrate uh, its uh, long-term adverse associations and even the costs associated with those. And in some senses, we might regard acute kidney injury as a sentinel perioperative complication. The canary in the coal mine, it is probably strongly associated with adverse outcomes in its own right, but it is also a very important flag for a patient who is going to have adverse long-term consequences. Okay, and this is the kind of patient we're talking about, a sort of middle-aged man who's undergoing undergo colorectal surgery. He has an, uh, uh, obviously a bowel problem. He also has some other comorbid diseases, but his health status is generally quite relatively okay. His bowel uh, cancer is yet to become overtly symptomatic. Um, he has uh, some chronic kidney disease and a bit of COPD, uh, 
but generally he can get out and about and be healthy. But he is far more vulnerable in the context of major surgery. And in particular, then, if he develops acute kidney injury in it during his hospital stay, that is going to have a very impactful um, uh, influence on his uh, longer term outcomes and indeed on the health of his other organ systems. And at this point, his health status is extremely bad. It's uncertain where it's going to go. He's been, got, he's been cured of his cancer, uh, but he's perhaps sitting there on dialysis at the moment. We have an uncertain future for his kidneys and his global health. Um, so peroptive AKI, it's just important before we go on to talk about cost to survey its incidence, relationship to short-term mortality. Some of this is a little bit replicative. Um, I think Max uh, alluded to this study, but uh, we did a, a meta-analysis of prevalence of AKI in most forms of major abdominal surgery. It's about 13%. This represents a very high-risk group who need focus to be placed on them. Uh, there are several things that can be done to identify patients at risk preoperatively, but obviously monitoring postoperatively is extremely important. It is quite variable between different contexts. Uh, some contexts will have very, very high incidence of acute kidney injury, uh, but actually it may be more, more impactful overall as a complication when it occurs in lower risk settings, uh, such as um, <clears throat> uh, the, the more general abdominal surgery. And uh, it has been strongly associated with relative risk of death overall. <clears throat> of course, there are several confounders in these, but the effect is so large that uh, some form of causative effect uh, is highly likely. And uh, there is certainly um, uh, considerable impetus to detect, uh, prevent, or ameliorate acute kidney injury in the perioperative setting. Uh, and this is another study carried out by the U in the UK. This is a nationwide survey run by medical students, collected a very large amount of data. Uh, it showed uh, AKI rates varying between different settings in major abdominal surgery. But the national mean rate um, in, that was reported was, again, about 13% overall. And importantly, what you can see here is that the rate of other complications uh, was higher in patients who had suffered acute kidney injury. And in particular, there was a shift towards more severe com other complications occurring. So AKI doesn't occur in isolation. It occurs as part of a cluster of complications. It may be a driving factor in causing that cluster to occur. Um, and so this is why AKI is associated with increased mortality, even small changes in plasma creatinine. And I would put it to you that strategies that might prevent AKI, if they actually have an influential effect on organ function rather than some uh, sort of um, uh, other effect, which just affected, say, serum creatinine or urine output in a way that wasn't associated with kidney injury. So we do have to be careful about how our interventions are evaluated. Uh, they would be expected to improve overall patients' outcomes, including other organ dysfunctions. Uh, but it is rather a chicken and the egg kind of argument, and that's um, uh, always going to challenge us in this situation. Uh, but really, the way in which we're going to solve this is by looking at the influence of uh, interventions to uh, prevent or treat perioperative AKI and seeing what how profound the outcome benefits are. Um, and uh, I would put it to you, as I've just said, even mild AKI could be a causative factor in mediating perioperative uh, complications, uh, often because of the organ crosstalk mechanisms, and also longer-term complications because accelerated CKD is a potent mediator of long-term post-operative risk. And this leads us to sort of then think about how we evaluate the cost of perioperative AKI because it may be very profound if it's so associated with so many different adverse outcomes. Uh, and there have been some studies on this. Um, uh, a couple of studies I'm going to show you come from uh, Charles Hobson, uh, who's both part of Azra Bierich's research group and her husband. Uh, he's a surgeon in the US, and uh, he uh, undertook a, uh, the couple of studies that I'm going to talk about, which looked at a very large database of surgical patients from Florida. And they looked at uh, the uh, hospital costs associated with AKI. So these are the upfront costs during the admission. We'll go on to post-admission a little bit more later. Um, and so AKI was upfront associated uh, with um, significantly more than doubling of the cost. And this uh, persisted uh, even when a number of other explanatory data variables were accounted for. 
Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, there was also a dose effect. So the more severe the AKI, the uh, the higher the um, the risk, the relative cost ratio, or that or the predicted absolute cost, uh, ranging from uh, uh, twenty six thousand dollars up to uh, sixty uh, without AKI to sixty two point six thousand dollars with AKI. Um, this data is uh, probably about 10 years old now, so the costs will be, uh, I think, um, uh, significantly higher as healthcare costs have increased over time, but the differentiation is likely to persist. Uh, and this, this, you can just see here the dose response in terms of the relative cost ratio. Uh, this is just to make the point that uh, organ uh, crosstalk is not just something we, we kind of imagine. It is very good experimental evidence to demonstrate that if you um, uh, injure kidneys, uh, you can get acute lung injury as a distant consequence without any other form of injurious stimuli to the lungs. This is a rodent model, uh, but um, uh, there is uh, considerable um, uh, um, observational evidence to suggest that such processes occur in humans as well. Of course, the process is a two-way. Lung injury can potentially induce kidney injury, uh, but um, that uh, doesn't detract from the importance of either of those complications. Um, so this is a few more data from uh, Charles Hobson's paper. Um, so uh, uh, the, uh, the AKI patients almost uh, well, near universally had other complications as well. Only 19% of them avoided having any other complications. However, this is quite a sick cohort. These are these are surgical ICU patients. They're not just one of the mill surgical patients. Uh, the those without AKI, only 50% of them had some other form of complication. AKI associated longer stays in ICU and in hospital. Uh, they're almost twice likely to be admitted to the SICU and uh, they um, were more likely to need mechanical ventilation, more likely to need it longer, and particularly uh, need it uh, to have prolonged mechanical ventilation. And so here are the risk-adjusted average costs again in terms of AKI uh, non-survivors and survivors, um, and uh, no AKI uh, survivors and non-survivors. And you can see here that uh, actually there's a very big magnifying effect of AKI. So not just AKI have a huge increase in cost, but the patients that we're trying to, um, uh, we, we fail to eventually rescue, uh, we're spending a very large amount of money on them, presumably through intensive care and organ support uh, before they actually die. This is something seen across all age ranges. Uh, patients who die without developing AKI uh, perhaps uh, have a much lower associated cost. And these may be some patients who perhaps had open and closed surgery and then palliative care, these kind of things. Um, it, it appears that if you die in hospital from complications, uh, that AKI is almost always part of that process. Um, and uh, this uh, just uh, looks at the association between different specific complications. Uh, you can look at this in the, in the paper overall, but I'll just pick out overall. This is just the top line is no additional complications on the AKI. And then there's a range of other complications. Um, and, and on one side, you see no API at all. On the other side, in the context of API, what you can see is the more and more complicated, the, 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 if you develop complications in addition to API, then your cost skyrockets. And this, as I've said, is actually the most common occurrence. Um, there's another analysis. This is confined to vascular surgical patients from the same group. Um, and this uh, shows really the same factor. Uh, vascular surgical patients often ha frequently have chronic kidney disease and indeed end stage renal failure um, in their um, cohort. And uh, what you can see here is that the uh, AKI has a potent effect on the cost of the admission when it occurs in the context of other complications. And that CKD has a similar effect to AKI, slightly less. And so um, uh, your AKI patient, you potentially should think of as being at higher risk as perhaps your dialysis patient undergoing, say, major limb revascularization. Um, uh, this shows the costs again. Um, what you've got here is the costs in those who died and those who survived. 
Um, basically, what this shows is the cost differential is much bigger in those who died, much more admitted, invested during the primary emission. However, this only is considering uh, um, the emission up to 90 days. And actually, what we've then got to consider is the cost burden after discharge, which this uh, kind of study has not examined. Uh, and so this when we look at the longer term cost of AKI after major surgery, we need to think about the long term consequences of AKI. Um, AKI remains strongly associated with morbidity and mortality after major surgery. Um, and this is probably going to have two factors, direct cause, causation and as an indication of illness, severity and physiological reserve in our patients. Now, it's difficult to pick those apart. But there is almost certainly evidence for causation, particularly because of biological plausibility in terms of acquisition of chronic kidney disease, which we know is a long term risk factor for death, end stage renal failure, major cardiovascular events. And the, the um, uh, dose effect in terms of severity of AKI and renal recovery and a range of other uh, inferences that we can make that make us suggest that there, there's a strong direct effect of AKI. But of course, it does uh, flag up those patients who were most vulnerable as well. Uh, Development CKD, as I've explained, a key mediator in uh, the association between AKI and adverse long term outcomes. And in, and in particular, chronic kidney disease is one of the most potent known uh, risk factors for cardiovascular morbidity and death. And many of these patients uh, suffer from these uh, sequelae rather than actually developing full-blown end-stage renal failure uh, because they succumb to other problems uh, before they've had sufficient nephron loss to get there. Um, <clears throat> and there is a vicious cycle with CKD of recurrent AKI, systemic inflammation, hypertension, proteinuria, dyslipidemia, and as I said, the adverse cardiovascular consequences, which, uh, you know, after a triggering event could lead our patient down a, uh, an unhappy road of uh, worsening chronic disease that is very difficult to avert. Uh, this just gives some evidence behind it. Um, this is, uh, again, some work from a big database in Florida. Uh, no AKI versus AKI survival over time. Patients with AKI have uh, significantly worse survival over time. Uh, the survival is related to the severity of the initial AKI. But importantly, it's also related to the recovery of renal function. But even more importantly, even complete recovery of renal function after the episode remains associated with a potent uh, increasing risk of death. And that's because uh, apparently recovered AKI uh, can still be associated with significant subclinical uh, renal uh, scarring uh, that can lead to ongoing nephron loss and eventually the development of overt chronic kidney disease. Uh, this um, uh, is either because uh, patients with AKI have recovered normal filtration, but in fact have abnormal underlying kidneys, much as happens early in diabetic nephropathy, for instance, and have uh, therefore a pathway into chronic kidney disease. And also because we fail to diagnose the severity of uh, renal impairment in patients after surgery, particularly if they have muscle wasting. So what about the long-term costs of AKI as opposed to the short-term, which I said are very large? Well, the long-term are probably even larger. Uh, most of the modelling has been associated with the risk of end-stage kidney disease in these patient populations, as well as the other complications. Uh, this is a busy graph, but it's an analysis of a large amount of surgical data from veteran repairs databases. And it shows that a decline in renal function after surgery is strongly associated with a long-term hazard of developing end-stage renal disease. And this hazard is, is magnified in the context of patients having had perioperative AKI versus those who don't. Uh, and it probably indicates that uh, 25 to 30 percent decline in EGFR around about 90 days is, uh, is a very good uh, cutoff for identifying patients at more severe long term risk who need uh, certainly would need some firm long term follow up. Uh, but it's obviously a smooth continuum of risk. <clears throat> the end-stage renal failure population continues to get larger and larger, uh, certainly in the UK and, uh, uh, and in the US and in many other countries around the world, and uh, is uh, a population who consume enormous amount of healthcare resources. Um, what are the financial costs of chronic kidney disease, of which AKI is an important cause? Uh, this has been estimated in the NHS. Uh, it was estimated to be annually 1.45 billion. $1 
uh, in a paper published 10 years ago. So you could probably triple that now. Um, and that was equivalent to uh, £795 for each person with a diagnosis of CKD. Uh, and dialysis alone accounted for 35% of that, percent of that total expenditure. And even things like transport to dialysis on uh, ambulances and, and other uh, cars uh, for infirm patients, it's a very significant cost to the nation. Um, so having this sort of data, other investigators made did some modelling of the economic impact of acute kidney injury, uh, taking into account these long-term outcomes, including end-stage renal disease, and the relationship with CKD. Uh, and they used some quite granular local data, particularly from uh, East Kent area, uh, to do modeling that then informed the overall NHS data, enabled them to make some estimates. And this was published um, 2014. And at that point, they estimated that API related inpatient care, and obviously that uh, consumed uh, just about a billion. And uh, the lifetime cost of post-discharge care for people with AKI was then estimated at 179 million uh, per annum. Uh, and again, that's 10 years ago, so you could significantly increase that now. Um, and uh, obviously, a lot of this upfront cost may be associated with the acute disease that gives people AKI in the first place, their cost of surgery. But this stuff down the line, well, that's definitely the preventable area. Um, but it's, it's more than just about money. Uh, clearly, we want to avoid patients developing chronic kidney disease and especially end-stage renal failure. This is a cartoon drawn by a dialysis patient uh, who uh, had a, a suitably black humour approach to dealing with their condition and, um, and really reflects that uh, many patients on dialysis have poor quality of life and are uh, significantly affected by the burdens of their therapy and is certainly something we want to avoid, not only because it's expensive. Life on dialysis is not a good one. Um, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, this is just some measures of health-related quality of life uh, um, from around the world in dialysis patients, showing that there was significantly impaired quality of life uh, across the, all the different domains, really. Look, this is not to say that people can't live well-fulfilled lives on dialysis. Uh, uh, but um, clearly, I think anybody who's on dialysis, irrespective of how well filled their life is, would prefer not to be on dialysis. Um, and so what this really means is actually rather than just doing a cost, we've got to do a proper health economic approach to the evaluation of acute kidney injury and its short and long term consequences. Uh, this is a complex kind of analysis. It may involve some modelling of long term outcomes. There are a number of different approaches which are discussed in this paper. We don't have time to consider those there, but it's a very important uh, factor to remember. So to conclude, AKI is a common perioptive complication associated with increased risk of death, length of stay, and other perioptive complications. And all of these greatly compound the cost of any episode. In the longer term, perioptive AKI is associated with a range of adverse outcomes, CKD, cardiovascular mortality, risk of death, and these all have very large associated costs. And therefore, evaluation of strategies to prevent or treat perioptive AKI really need to include robust health economic analysis, probably including some form of modelling of the long-term benefits of AKI avoidance in order to really um, convince uh, funders that uh, adoption of these strategies is going to be uh, uh, beneficial overall and cost-effective and actually get the money to improve our services. And I'll conclude that. Thank you. John, thank you very much for uh, this excellent presentation. We have, uh, we are running very late, actually. We have time for only one quick question, John. Remember the, the first slide of Max at the very beginning of the session, reporting that anesthesiologists and surgeons uh, did not, do not actually really know uh, and not aware about AKI uh, in the perioperative period. What, what, what do you think if they knew that uh, this uh, AKI, this syndrome, costs so much money, do you think it could be a good idea to increase this uh, AKI awareness? I, I think it could be. Um, I think that, you know, uh, motivating um, uh, clinicians who are very heavily focused on doing the job that they do extremely well, 
uh, to pay attention to something that may have long, very long-term consequences is difficult. I personally think the best way to do this is to make patients aware, because most patients are not aware of AKI, its long-term consequences. Most people who have AKI may not be aware of it. And actually then the public may drive uh, their clinicians to be aware of this, because they could ask things like, what about my kidneys, doctor? What are you going to do about that? And uh, the um, and that's a, a, a sort of important driver uh, for uh, d other clinicians to take this kind of things more seriously. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much again. And uh, with that, I would like to thank our uh, four uh, international speakers, the two Johns, Marlies and Max, for their contribution to this meeting. And uh, uh, now it's just time to close, actually, not only the session, but the entire day, and this day on uh, international uh, uh, sessions. So with that, I would like to thank you all for, I would like to thank the audience for their uh, participation. And I wish you a very good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.